Welcome back to The Real Story. In the past few election cycles, we've seen more absentee ballots being cast. For some people, they're convenient and were more accessible during the pandemic. But do more absentee ballots mean less secure elections? I'm joined now by Adam Powell, Executive Director of the Election Cybersecurity Initiative. Thanks for being with us today, Adam. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So since the pandemic, we've seen an increase in absentee ballots, and many people question how secure that process is. So do absentee ballots lead to more voter fraud? Well, it's unclear whether it's led to more voter fraud. However, there's always a tension between convenience and security. The more convenient you make it, almost always the less secure you make it. And I'll give you the extreme case. Uh, think of uh, Americans serving in the armed services overseas. We want to enable these patriotic Americans to vote. How do we do that? And so what some states have done is to enable them to vote over the internet. That is really pressing the boundaries of security. Uh, because if you uh, talk to uh, like Vince Cerf, the co-inventor of the internet, he'll tell you, no, we're not ready for internet voting. But in the case of these people serving overseas, we make an exception. Uh, during the uh, pandemic two years ago, many states, most states, changed the way they voted to accommodate people who couldn't leave home uh, for whatever reason or were reluctant to come physically to polling places. And so we saw a lot of changes that loosened the uh, rules for in-person voting. Uh, did that create more fraud? We don't know. Uh, there's some indications that it might have, but it, the, the, the cases are, are a very small number. But it does introduce a new um, uh, a new reduction of security. I mean, if you want to look at the most secure way to vote, think of how people voted in Iraq. Uh, if you remember back uh, some years ago, they had to show up at the polling place, they had a voter ID, and after they voted, so they couldn't vote again, their fingers were marked with a purple indelible ink. Now, that's pretty inconvenient. It's very secure, but pretty inconvenient. So uh, I don't think very many Americans will want to go that far. But uh, for 2022 and 2024, um, we will have obviously some absentee ballots. And the question is how far we want to go. Absolutely. Have cybersecurity threats increased in recent years? Uh, we know that cybersecurity threats are increasing. Uh, and part of it is that uh, the bad actors, and I have to say that Russia is devoting more resources to research and development on how to hack American elections and more people and resources to hack American elections, uh, and other countries are following them. The Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians, they will watch what Russia is doing. And so we see new innovative ways of attacking our systems, um, usually first from Russia and then from others. And so in our workshops that we conduct around the country, we've gone to each of the 50 states, uh, first in person and then during COVID virtually, we emphasize protecting against attacks from particularly Russia. Uh, because if you're prepared for a, a cyber attack from Russia, uh, you're ready for anything that any other bad actor, uh, foreign or domestic, will throw, will throw against you. Right. Uh, have they increased? Yes. And the reason is that since 2016, countries around the world, foreign intelligence services around the world, have seen they can relatively cheaply hack into American elections and campaigns, so they do. You mentioned hacking and Russia quite a bit. Was the 2020 election hacked? Uh, we know that they attempted to, that, that Russia and others attempted to hack into elections. Uh, they, one of the best um, uh, images that uh, I recall from 2020 was the Secretary of State of Kentucky. He said, we see them trying the doorknobs all the time. As far as we know, they didn't get in. And so they keep, <laughs> so and they keep trying. How, well, if they're trying, how is that detected and how do election security officials work to stop that? 
Well, that's a great question because uh, if you talk to the experts, uh, and uh, uh, for example, uh, there's a reporter named Joseph Marks at the Washington Post. He has written a daily cybersecurity column for the Washington Post for more than three years. And he said, you know, if the Russians had tried to hack our elections back in 2014, we probably would never know, have never known. But now we have so many defenses up and so many precautions in place that uh, we can see these attempts from Russia and other countries as they try to get in. Uh, do they get in? Uh, the, the good news is that our defenses are much better. The good news is that there are more than 8,000 election districts in the United States. So if you're trying to change an election result, it's really very difficult. So instead, what do the bad actors do? Homeland Security has a wonderful phrase for this. They talk about return on investment. What's the return on investment for a bad actor? Okay, they can't change an election result because it would be too hard. Instead, let's just reduce the confidence in democracy itself. Let's reduce the confidence in American elections. So that's what the bad actors are doing more and more. And uh, it's not just Russia, it's not just China, it's not just Iran, it's not just North Korea. There are, according to David Sanger, who covers um, uh, intelligence for the New York Times, there are 38 countries hacking into the United States. That's quite a few. And when it comes to election security, there's focus on three main areas, cybersecurity, physical threats, and disinformation. Which do you think will be the most prominent in November, if you can, if you can pick one? <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's going to be the most prominent, the most troublesome one is probably going to be disinformation, simply because that's the one which uh, requires a bit more of a defense and a bit more uh, intelligence about how to defend against it. Cybersecurity, it's amazing how most of the cybersecurity breaches in the United States, up, up, up to and including Colonial Pipeline, which, you know, as you, as you know, uh, hit uh, a huge part of the country, is because of very simple human errors involving passwords. So many people use password one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six. The bad actors are gonna try those. The bad, the bad actors will try any word that you use because they all have a list of words. It's called the dictionary. So they will try every word in the dictionary trying to penetrate your campaign, your election system. So all you have to do is take some very simple, simple steps to protect yourself against uh, the basic cybersecurity uh, attacks, and that will protect you against most of them. Disinformation is tougher because now you have to figure out uh, how do you not only defend against bad information, but how do you anticipate that information? Uh, and that's a, a whole field which uh, we, we, the United States, and democracies around the world are just beginning to try to, uh, to try to gear up. And there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation on social media with the advent of a lot more information on the internet. Last question, what's the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Disinformation is what bad actors do deliberately. They are deliberately planting bad information uh, to make you do something, to make you uh, not go to the polls, to make you lose faith in democracy. This information is what many people do, uh, sharing bad information inadvertently. They don't know it's bad. Uh, it may be just fun. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the real threat here is that so many things on social media, on Facebook, on TikTok, or whatever, there's so much fun. They may not be true, but it's so much fun to share them. And research has shown that information that is not true is shared more often and more quickly, that information that is true. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Understood. We'll have to see what happens come November. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Now, whether you're marking your calendar to head to the polls Tuesday, November 8th, or planning to apply for an absentee ballot like we've been discussing, it's time to start getting to know the candidates you'll be voting for. We're taking a look back at primary night and which candidates advanced to take their spots on your ballots. In the 
Republican primary for U.S. Senate Leora Levy, a first-time political candidate and GOP fundraiser who was endorsed by former President Donald Trump, beat out party endorsed Themis Claritus. She got that Trump endorsement and joins an extensive slate of candidates nationwide who have come out from behind to win their primaries with the help of the coveted Trump thumbs up. Now, she will move on to face incumbent Richard Blumenthal. Despite facing the lowest approval ratings of his career, Blumenthal has yet to lose a race in his 37-year career. And Connecticut hasn't elected a Republican to the U.S. Senate in more than three decades. Voters chose their nominees to replace longtime Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, who resigned in June to care for her husband. State Representative Stephanie Thomas, who was the party's endorsed candidate beat out New Haven's health director, Maritza Bond. Thomas made an appeal primary night to unaffiliated and Republican voters to fill in her bubble in November to put an end to election conspiracy theories and rampant misinformation. As for the Republican nominee, Dominic Rapini, the endorsed party candidate and vocal critic of Connecticut election security, came ahead. He took the lead over longtime state representative Terry Wood. Rapini was reprimanded for for making baseless claims of voter fraud during the 2020 election. He says he wants to tighten ID requirements and do closer reviews of the state's voter rolls. Democratic State Treasurer Sean Wooden will be vacating his seat, so one name you'll see on your ballot is Eric Russell, an attorney who won the Democrats' nomination primary night by quite a margin. If Russell wins in the November election, he would be the first black out LGBTQ person ever elected to statewide office in United States history. Russell says his priorities are financial literacy, strengthening state pension funds, and making sure Connecticut's investments are socially responsible. Russell's opponent for the position is Republican Harry Aurora, who's a state representative for the town of Greenwich and says he wants to focus on stopping excessive state spending to improve pension returns to try and drive down inflation. You've heard from many of these candidates right here on The Real Story with us. And with the general election fast approaching on November 8th, you watch The Real Story every Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on Fox 61 to stay up to date with the candidates and issues on your ballot. Remember, you can catch today's segments in full on our website at fox61.com or you can download the free Fox 61 News app. We'll see you right back here next Sunday at 10 a.m. Have a great day.